Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Ghost Countries. Today, we're traveling to South America, more specifically, Venice. Wait, what? Well, to Klein Venedig, not, so not actually Venice, but yeah. It would be, you know, just a little bit surprising to find it in South America, wouldn't it? Oh, and just a quick plug, you can find us over on Instagram, there you go. We share a bunch of infographics and other historical content over there, and with that out of the way, let's get to it. Klein Venedig, which literally means Little Venice, was the name of a colony in what is nowadays Colombia and Venezuela. Bit of a side note here, but Venezuela itself got its name from Venice too. Early explorers among them, Christopher Columbus, found the region's inhabitants living in stilt houses on lakes, and since it reminded them of, well, Venice, they called it Veneziola, which in Italian meant something like Little Venice. This name was later applied to the German colony, and under Spanish control, it would transform into Venezuela. Before going any further though, this whole story needs a little background, since you're probably wondering how the Germans created a colony in the 16th century when, you know, Germany still didn't really technically exist. To understand this, we have to look into two things, the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire and a specific German noble family. Let's talk about the Emperor first though. His name was Charles V, and he was set to become Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire in 1519. Some of you with an interest in the HRE probably have heard about him already, since his reign was rather significant. It was during this time that the Reformation took place, and thanks in no small part to his lineage, Charles found himself ruling over a vast empire, being Emperor of the HRE with direct control over the Grand Duchy of Austria, while, as the King of Spain, he controlled Sicily, southern Italy, Burgundy, and parts of the Netherlands. Moreover, as he was King of Spain, Charles had control over said country's vast overseas territories it had acquired in the New World. But, in order to secure his position within the HRE, Charles needed to be elected, and that wasn't cheap. Contenders had to spend quite a lot of money for bribes and other means of financial leverage, <laughs> among the Empire's many dukes. So, he decided to borrow some money from two of the richest families of the time, the Fuga and Walsa. The latter being the German noble family I mentioned earlier, and noble they were, hailing from the free imperial city of Augsburg, while the family head, Bartholomews, claimed to be a descendant of the Byzantine military commander Belisarius. Either way, the deal seemingly paid off with Charles winning the election and securing his position as emperor. But, somewhat importantly, he could not pay back his loans, even a few years after the election. So, in March 1528, he reached an agreement with the Walsa family to lease a sizable territory in South America that roughly corresponded with the borders of modern-day Venezuela. The Walsa were allowed to install governors and various other officials, plus they didn't have to pay salt taxes and other tariffs in the port of Seville, which was the Spanish port for all products coming from the Americas. Moreover, they were allowed to enslave the local population, and in addition to this imported some 4,000 people from Africa as slaves. All European settlers would receive land, while the colony would be required to establish two cities and build three forts. Charles would, of course, in turn get 10% of all gold, silver, and diamonds mined in the colony's borders. And speaking of borders, the boundaries of the colony were a little vague. The western boundary was the Cape of La Vela, and the easternmost the Cape of Maracapana. The northern and southern boundaries, though, were defined as de la una mar a la otra, which literally means from one sea to the other. The northern sea likely refers to the Caribbean, but the southern one? Well, don't forget this contract was drawn up in 1528, the Americas having been discovered just 36 years prior. And don't at me about Leif Erikson, John Cabot, St. Brendan, the Phoenicians, the Salutrian hypothesis, or... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm sure we'll do videos about those eventually as well. Anyway, on a map from 1530, the colony's borders go all the way down to the Magellan Strait, which itself was just discovered only a few years back, so the southern boundary was kind of unclear. But, alright, let's talk about the colony itself. In 1529, Ambrosius Eingar, the first governor of Klein Venedig, arrived together with 281 settlers and established the city of New Augsburg, which nowadays is the city of Koro. In August of the same year, Eingar set off on an expedition to the west of Lake Maracaibo, 
fighting a series of battles with the indigenous people, the Kokivakoa. Following this, Eyinger founded another city he named New Nuremberg, which later would be renamed after the Kokivakoa's leader, Maracaibo. But this would not be the last of Eyinger's expeditions in country. Some years later, he set off again, this time to find the mystical El Dorado. But first, just a quick call to action here. If you like the channel and want to help us grow, consider subscribing uh, if you haven't done so already. You can also comment and like this video, that helps with the algorithm as well. And yeah, let's get back to the video. El Dorado, for those of you who don't know, is a legendary city made entirely from gold, rumored to be hidden away somewhere deep in the darkest depths of South America. Many explorers, would-be adventurers, and fortune seekers have tried to find it, and just as many have died from disease, starvation, or in battles with hostile indigenous peoples. Theories about El Dorado continue to persist even today because, quite often, there is a kernel of truth behind most legends. Eyinger, however, would meet his fate during one such expedition. Traveling along the La Bria River in what is now Colombia, a number of Eyinger's crew, who in previous weeks had been forced to eat their horses and dogs as starvation set in, died passing through difficult mountainous terrain. If things couldn't get worse for those still alive, they were then attacked by the Chicherero people. During said attack, Eyinger received an arrow to the neck. No, he didn't actually die from this, but rather would pass away a few days later owing to the fact that the Chicharrero frequently used poisoned arrows. The few men who survived then returned to New Augsburg. The colony itself, however, wasn't doing so well either. The original plan was to gain money by selling precious metals, salt, and dye wood. But in actuality, the only success Klein Venedig experienced was in the slave trade. Because of this, German officials went all in and they soon earned a dread reputation even among the colony's Spanish settlers. The Walsa did try to encourage Germans to immigrate to the colony, and they did experience some success, mainly in getting miners to come for temporary work. However, the vast majority of the colony's population remained made up of Spanish settlers and indigenous peoples. Speaking candidly, there was little to encourage large-scale European immigration to the colony, especially because the Walsa didn't really invest into the colony's infrastructure or expanding its economic opportunities. Rather, they remained overly reliant on the only lucrative means of income in the colony, at least from their perspective, the slave trade. Writing on the matter, Bartolome de las Casas, a Spanish missionary, noted, quote, The Germans are worse than the wildest of lions. Out of greed, these devils in human shape act much more brutal than their predecessors." End quote. A prominent religious figure, De La Casas advocated for the indigenous peoples and was relatively popular among the settlers, so his words held some sway. The governors of Klein Venedig, nonetheless, didn't seem to pay him any attention, with Gerg Hjermuth, also known as Gerg van Speyer, and Nicholas Föderman, both more than preoccupied funding expeditions to, guess what? find El Dorado. Yeah, how'd you like that pronunciation there? Pretty on point, am I right? Oh my gosh. Anyway, there actually was even one expedition where they both set out together. After some time, the expedition divided into two groups though. One led by Fiederman, the other by Van Speyer. The two having agreed to rendezvous at a prearranged location. However, when Van Speyer's company arrived, weakened from attacks by hostile tribes and tropical diseases, Fiederman wasn't there. And yeah, the two who didn't really like each other before this really didn't like each other after this, although both of them did make it back alive. Some years later, in 1543, Philip van Houten became governor of Klein Venedig. He too went on an expedition and faced pretty much exactly the same problems you'd expect. Having almost died and with no trace of him or his men, van Houten suddenly returned, kind of a reverse homer here, only to find that a Spaniard, Juan de Carvajal was appointed governor in his absence thanks to falsified papers supporting his claim. Carvajal refused to give up his newfound position, believing Van Houten, weakened by the failed expedition and with just a handful of his men, in too weak a position to challenge him. Therefore, Carvajal sought a formal acknowledgement of authority by Van Houten, but he underestimated the jungle-hardened German and his remaining men. A companion of Van Houten's, Bartholomus VI, Walsa, later wounded Caravajal, who in turn granted them free passage to New Augsburg. 
And yes, that man was the leader of the Walsa family at the time. So they went on to New Augsburg, but Carvajal, going back on his word to leave them unmolested, attacked the motley crew en route. Having not anticipated this battle, Carvajal soon managed to capture and behead both Van Houten and Walsa. For that, Carvajal himself was later sentenced to death as well. But for the Walsa family, this essentially marked an end to their adventures in Klein Venedig, with Charles choosing to not extend the territory's lease. In the emperor's opinion, the colony was a complete disaster, corrupt, dependent on imports from the Caribbean, and in dire economic straits. Bartholomew V, the father of the beheaded companion of Van Houten, tried to regain these rights through legal means until 1556, but he was ultimately not successful. And soon, all hopes for the Walsa family were gone, with Klein Venedig slowly becoming Venezuela, and German influence becoming just a distant memory. And with that, I hope you guys liked this episode of Ghost Countries, or should it be Ghost Colonies here? And we'll see you again next time. Peace. <laughs>